Peace be with you. Friends, welcome to our online worship. I'm so glad you've joined us. If you're in the Port Hope area, we'd love to see you as we gather for worship on Sunday mornings at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. with Bible study next door in the parish hall at 9.30 a.m. We also gather for worship on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. and this month we're at St. Mark's Church here in Port Hope for those services. We have online prayer groups and a whole variety of activities on our parish website, to which you'll find a link in the video description below. And if these videos are a blessing to you, please support us by making a donation at the link in the video description. Finally, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you never miss any of our content. Our reading from Holy Scripture today is from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 21, verses 5 to 19. Let's hear these holy words together. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another, all will be thrown down. They asked him, teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and plagues. And there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons. And you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish by your endurance, you will gain your souls. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, friends, in my library at home, I have a bookshelf filled mostly with books for preachers. And many of them are commentaries on the Bible, on the readings we hear Sunday by Sunday as the lectionary arranges them. A few of them, though, are books about preaching, reflections on the craft. Now turn to the preface of any of these books about preaching and no matter when they were written, no matter in which century, which epoch of the Christian era they were published, somewhere in the preface they're bound to say something like this. The challenge facing preachers today is greater than it has ever been. Or Preachers today must address a world besieged by uncertainty. That kind of thing. Now I think that's because there's a tendency that we have to regard the challenges of the age in which we live as greater than the world has ever faced before. Things aren't what they used to be is a refrain that has resounded down the ages. We all know how short the span of a single human life is compared to the great sweep of history. And so every once in a while, something happens that shakes us to such an extent that we truly believe, if only briefly, that we are facing a challenge the likes of which the world has never seen. Usually, thank God, we're wrong. But that feeling remains. I was reminded of this when I looked at the gospel reading appointed for today in which Jesus speaks of the destruction of the temple and the coming tribulations that his followers will face. 
It's interesting that this reading comes up in the lectionary always around the time of election season south of the border. U.S. elections, as we've just seen this week, always and increasingly, it seems, create an atmosphere of uncertainty. Now, whether one sympathizes more with the blue team or the red team, elections reveal in surprising ways the extent to which otherwise reasonable and sane people have placed an outsized emphasis on the importance of one side or the other having the reins of power. Not that that isn't important or shouldn't attract our attention, but there is a strong current of fervent, and I would say even idolatrous, obsession with political power. That can truly destabilize a society. And lest we notice the mote in our neighbor's eye and ignore the beam in our own, our present age, I would argue, has revealed on a global scale, in a way that many chose not to recognize before, that there is nothing inevitable, nothing indestructible about the global order, about democratic government, nor about the ways that human beings choose to govern themselves. Where is the temple of democracy if not in Washington or Ottawa or London? What does it feel like to know that it may be said of all those grand buildings that the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another? All will be thrown down. It feels, well, uncertain. Often, when we're faced with uncertainty, particularly when that uncertainty involves the instability of an order that we have come to think of as more or less indestructible or inevitable, we cannot help but be afraid. And if we feel scared at that thought, then we have some insight into how Jesus' disciples felt when they heard him say that the center of their cultural and religious life, the temple, would fall. Jesus warned that despite all of its grandeur and beauty, that the temple would one day, within their own lifetimes even, be no more. There was nothing inevitable about it. In fact, the only inevitable thing was a looming calamity. But Jesus didn't stop there. He said that what was on the horizon was a time of great challenge and suffering, a time of temptation to follow those who would claim to be saviors, redeemers in their own rights, a time of division, even among parents and siblings. Do you know the poem Ozymandias by Percy Shelley? Perhaps you studied it in school as I did. Let me read it to you. Ozymandias. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. You may agree with me that it's a haunting bit of verse. Ozymandias, the king of kings, must have been a fearsome force to be reckoned with, but now his stony likeness lies ruined, half hidden in a wasteland, boundless and bare. That poem is a caution to all about the human desire for power and prestige. But more than that, a reminder of how fleeting these and all things truly are a reflection on the impermanence of human life. Friends, it is as true of human beings today as it was in the time that Shelley wrote, as it was in the time of our Lord, that people desire a sense of permanence. 
We deny our own frailty and mortality by building up, in a variety of ways, monuments for ourselves. Most of us, if we aren't among the very rich and the very powerful, will not commission great statues bearing our likenesses, but we will seek that same sense of solidity in our own ways. We will tell ourselves the comforting lie that some part of what we can see and touch or experience today will stand forever. We may not imagine ourselves kings of kings, but we will participate in the same futile exercise represented in the ruined hulk Ozymandias, of building monuments among ourselves and telling ourselves they'll stand forever. I'm always reminded of Shelley's poem when I read this gospel. How must it have felt for the followers of Jesus walking in that enormous edifice where it was believed that Yahweh, the God of Israel, in a very real way resided? To hear their master say, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another, all will be thrown down. Shattering all at once the illusion of permanence they had clung to. What was on the horizon was a time of great challenge and suffering, a time of temptation, a time of division. The suffering would be real, but it would not be final. Now, scholars generally agree that the gospel according to Luke, the gospel from which our reading this morning comes, was written sometime between the years 80 and 90 AD. What we know from history is that the temple in Jerusalem was indeed destroyed around 70 AD, some 40 years after Jesus foretold its destruction. The date at which the gospel was written is therefore important. These words of Jesus were remembered and written down after the calamity that he foretold had already taken place. The temple had indeed been destroyed. War and famine had indeed come. Persecutions had indeed racked the followers of Jesus. And yet, the evangelist is careful to note Jesus' promise. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. Had these words of Jesus not proven true, surely St. Luke's gospel would have been written differently, if written at all. Our Lord did not promise that following him would make his disciples' lives easier or even happier, certainly not that it would make their lives safer. In fact, here and elsewhere in the Gospels, he promises quite the opposite, that following him will have real and difficult consequences. But what Jesus offers in return for discipleship is something that no king or queen, no prime minister and no president could offer. Jesus offers citizenship in an eternal kingdom, a kingdom unbound from the passing rules and reigns and regimes of this world, a kingdom of justice and peace where he reigns sovereign, a new kingdom, a new heaven, a new earth. Friends, it is desperately tempting in times of trouble or uncertainty for Christians to retreat into this notion of the kingdom of God as though it meant that all of the difficulties of the present age would simply go away. As though building the kingdom meant building monuments and sheltering, hunkering down within them. It does not mean that. And we should resist the urge to disengage from our present reality, to retreat from it. For Christians are meant to be Christians no matter the circumstance. Citizenship in the kingdom of God, in other words, comes with duties as well as privileges. And in the face of coming calamity, it is these duties of which Jesus reminds his disciples, and one in particular, the opportunity to testify. But how do Christians testify in times of uncertainty, other than with the testimony of their lives? In times of uncertainty, it is the common vocation of all Christians 
to order their lives according to the teachings of Jesus. It is incumbent upon all of us who desire citizenship in God's kingdom to work for the good of our society, to confront injustice wherever we find it, to testify with our lives that Jesus is King of Kings, because that's how we get a foretaste of the heavenly banquet. That's how we catch a glimpse of what life in the kingdom will look like. And when we do this by living lives of purpose and peace, never growing weary in doing what is right, never despairing as those who have no hope, but rejoicing in the promise of our shared inheritance where that place, in that place where Christ is king. It will not always be easy. It may be frightening. It may cost us more than we ever thought we'd have to pay, but it remains our calling as God's elect. For the assurance of the love of God revealed perfectly in Jesus is the only certainty we have. Fortunately, it's also the only certainty we require. And God bless you. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For peace from on high and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our bishops and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Charles, our King, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For good weather and for abundant harvests for all to share, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the absolution and remission of our sins and offenses, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. And for all who have died, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together, you will hear their requests. Fulfill now our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come eternal life. For you, Father, are good and loving, and we glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen.